Keystone Church. Good morning. So glad that you are joining us online here this weekend. Big weekend. We're celebrating our one year anniversary as a church. Can you believe it? It has been a wild year, but I've just been blown away by the faithfulness of God over these past 12 months. And obviously, if you are watching church online this weekend, you're not going to be seeing the service that's in person today. But I need you to know this. If you've been engaged with us over the last nine months plus that we've had services online, you are just as much a part of Keystone Church as if you were sitting in a seat here this weekend. So I want to say thank you for the way you've been praying, engaging, believing God with us for lives to be changed. We actually just had an outreach yesterday at Light of Salvation Church in Beaver Falls. We were able to practically package and distribute over 500 meals for families in need. And what that looked like is families that when they receive this box of food, they could feed their family of five for an entire week. There were also toys, school supplies involved. And I just want you to know, as we do every weekend, we pray and we thank God for our ability to give and trust him with our giving. I need you to know that your giving is making a significant eternal impact. Thank you for your generosity. We cannot wait to celebrate all that God's doing here this weekend and what is next in year two as we enter 2021. If you would, before you get a chance to watch service here this Sunday, pray with me this morning. Lord, we just thank you for this opportunity that we have to celebrate all that you have done the past 12 months. God, it's truly a miracle in the making and it's all because of you, Jesus. Help keep us as a church innocent, grounded, focused, and passionate about all that you have for us to accomplish. We love you and we trust you with what's next. In Jesus' name, amen. Celebrate with us and let's worship the Lord this morning. Keystone, please stand and worship with us today. We are so thankful that you are here. Thank you so much for coming. Let us worship the Lord together. I've searched the world But it couldn't fill me And men's empty praise The treasures that made Are never
Good morning, Keystone Church. Glad you guys are with us. How many of you are thankful you're in the house of God here this weekend? No other place better to be than worshiping our Savior. I want to welcome you if this is your first time here. We're glad that you're with us. There's a connect card around you near your seat. We'd love to know as a church how we could better serve you, pray for you if you have a need. We just would love to know as a church how we can make this place feel a little bit more like home. And we're going to continue worshiping here uh, with our team, but I want to read this passage of Scripture that I think is very appropriate based on what is taking place in our country here uh, at the start of 2021. In fact, I was just telling our team a little bit before service. It was like, we're all so excited to exit one year to get to the next. And then it's like, man, there's already things that are stirring us up at the start of a brand new year. I think it's the perfect time to talk about the subject that we're going to be looking at the Word when it comes to prayer and fasting here this weekend, because there's no better time than for us to focus our attention, our hearts, and our lives towards Christ like never before. It says this in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. This is a great reminder for all of us as we start this new year. If we're not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Listen, I know there's a lot of tension surrounding many areas possibly in your life. You know, I could understand why it's easy to get confused right now, easy to get hurt right now, perhaps have a lot of questions for God and there's not a whole lot of answers right now in this season. But the word's very clear that especially when we have moments where we don't understand, when we don't know what to do next. Prayer is always our priority. It's not our last resort. We look to the Lord first. We seek Him, and that's exactly what we're going to do right now. So I just encourage you, let's take the next few minutes as we worship the Lord and we just focus our attention on Him. Just prepare your hearts for everything He wants to do, not only this weekend and this service here this morning, but for the rest of this year. Let's make this a year where we look back and we say, God, this was the year I grew closer to you than ever before. Pray with me here this morning. Lord, we just, we do commit this time to you. We worship you. You're the reason that we came. And God, with open hands and open hearts, we are praying for our country right now. We lift up the United States. God, we pray for healing for our land. And God, we repent for sins that have caused your heart to hurt. God, we're turning our face, our attention, and our focus towards you. That's our declaration here this weekend. We need more of you. And God, I also pray for other churches in this community, other great pastors and leaders that are standing up here this weekend, and they're aiming their attention towards Christ as well. God, we're certainly not the only church around, and that's never going to be the goal. So as we do each week, we lift up another church in our community. I pray for Steel City Church, church that's just getting started. God, they're near the downtown area, and I'm just praying that as they look towards launching and starting their work this year, God, that your hand will be on that team, your hand will be on that church. Lord, that you would reach many people who are far from you because of the work that you're doing. God, we love you. Thank you for this time that we get to focus our hearts and our lives towards you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's continue to worship the Lord here this morning.
wants to live Call these lungs to sing once again yeah. I will pray Cause you are way maker, 
miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. in every heart I worship you I worship you you are here healing every heart I worship you oh I worship you you are here turning lives around we worship you, I worship you, you are here, mending every heart, I worship you, oh, I worship you, cause you are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the dark. don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, Jesus working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, cause Jesus you are. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper. Sing praises to our King. That is who you Stop working, you never stop, it's Jesus, yeah. We 
worshiping Jesus, then we got to get to 2022 or something. I don't know. You should be excited to be in the house of God here this weekend. I'm glad that we're all together. I hope the start of your new year um, has gone well with everything that possibly you're aiming for. I talked about this a few weeks ago. This is the day, statistically, January 10th, where the majority of people that started a New Year's resolution, where you abandon it at this point in the year, just 10 days in. So you're either going to walk out of church here feeling like a hero or a failure. I'm not really sure what, but um, I'm glad that you guys are with us. Uh, just as a reminder, we talk about this every week. Connect 2 is happening immediately after our service. And a Connect is our two-week process as a church. We do this every first and second Sunday of the month. It gives you a little bit of vision, values, who we are practical next steps on how to get involved here at Keystone. I would encourage you to check it out. Food, child care, we've got everything covered for you. If you didn't sign up, just show up. It's okay. And then next weekend, we've been talking about this a lot. We actually talked about it at the end of last year, entering into this year. Every third Saturday of the month, starting next weekend, Saturday, January 16th, is our Serve Saturday. That's our designated weekend every month. We're going to be serving in a practical way to our community. We actually, back in November, for our Thanks Serving Outreach, we partnered with a church, Light of Salvation in Beaver Falls, and we helped to serve Thanksgiving meal that particular weekend. And this weekend, this coming weekend, this coming Saturday, we're actually going to be helping them again. Because I don't know if you're aware of this, but the food insecurity right now that is hitting Beaver Falls is real. It's something that's needed on a weekly basis. And this church, they are boots on the ground, consistent every single week, feeding people. And so by the grace of God, we were able to partner with an outside organization that said, hey, you guys as a church can help organize, distribute, and feed 800 meals at your discretion over the start of 2021. And so on Saturday, we're going to be boxing, organizing, tearing down about four to seven pallets of food. And we're going to have about 250 meals that will each feed a family of five for one whole week. And so if you want to be a part of that, uh, we're going to start at 10 o'clock next weekend. We're going to send out more information, social media, email. You'll see it all. But easiest way, mark it down in your Connect card. Drop that in the offering container later. We'll make sure somebody from our team follows up and gets you all the information. Okay. So last weekend, we started a brand new series that coincides with the start of the new year called Fresh Start, and we're talking through some of the most important decisions that we can be making as individuals, as a church, to start a brand new year. If you weren't with us last week, we answered this question. Probably, uh, arguably, the most important question you could ask yourself at the start of any year, any given day, but what is it that you personally are going to do with Jesus? 
What are you going to do with Christ? We opened up Luke 10. We looked at the story of Mary and Martha. We found three things that really set Mary's response to Christ apart from her sister. And it was simply this. When you sit at the feet of Jesus, you're submitted and teachable. When you sit at the feet of Christ, you're focused on growing spiritually. And when you sit at the feet of Jesus, you're prioritizing his presence. We made the statement as we start a new year that we're not going to let anything that ultimately will mean nothing keep me from experiencing what means everything. And that's Jesus. That's our walk with him. We even had some reading plans, suggestions for you. More of these are out at the Welcome Center. If you need a one-year Bible reading plan, of course you can jump on your phone, some sort of technology. I'm going old school this year. just helps keep me focused. Uh, But get into the Word this year. Start somewhere. If you've never started or perhaps you got off to a good start, but now you're off track 10 days in, man, just dust yourself off, get back up, and get back into the Word. Don't let the enemy defeat you before we're even two weeks in to a brand new year. In fact, this weekend, we're talking about something that I'm going to let you know from the very beginning. This is a spiritual discipline. This is a spiritual truth that I need to grow in big time. And we're talking about prayer and fasting. We're going to be starting a church-wide fast, actually starting tonight, Sunday at 6 o'clock. My wife and I are going to do a little Facebook Live video, kind of encouraging us, getting us ready, and launching the start of this fast, which will then last a full week. And we're going to break the fast next weekend as we celebrate one year as a church. Can you all believe it's been one year already? Man. We're going to have pepperoni rolls, donuts. We're going to break the fast right. I'm just letting you know. There's light at the end of the tunnel. There's something to look forward to. And I'm going to just tell you that I'm going to have a lot to say. This message is going to look slightly different because of the topic at hand. I want to run through a bunch of different characteristics when it comes to fasting in general. Then scripturally, we're going to take a look at a few examples of moments where there were people that they fasted for specific reasons. What is the word? What does scripture have to tell us about this subject? And first, I'd love to share with you the characteristics of what prayer and fasting actually actually does. What it creates, promotes, cultivates, really the why behind the what, and then we're going to dig in to scripture here. If you want the direction of God for your life in 2021, if you want the wisdom of God for decisions that you're prayerfully considering as you start a brand new year, I'm going to just let you know it all starts with prayer starts with a a focused effort to seek the Lord before anything or anyone else. And when we couple this with fasting, it could become this powerful spiritual principle, discipline, combination. And what I'm recognizing right now, I think all of you would agree with me, but as a pastor, what I'm sensing, what has happened from 2020 and what's bled into this new year is there are things right now that are attempting to steal our peace, attempting to discourage us, tension between brothers and sisters in Christ. And there's all this just warring against one another. And it's mentioned, we mentioned this at the beginning of service, this battle is not a natural battle. I hope you understand that. I know there's a lot of natural tension that's taking place right now, but under the surface, this is what Scripture refers to refers to as spiritual warfare. We're not facing a physical army, but a spiritual army. And in order to combat that, when you're in the fight, our weapons have to be spiritual. So I shared it with our team before that prayer needs to be our first response, not our last resort. So if you're feeling disheartened or discouraged and you're just frustrated about many things when you walked in the doors here this weekend, I can understand Now, the first response to that should not necessarily be to react to the emotions that we're experiencing. It should be to go to the Lord in prayer. We're seeking him first. That's why we're fasting. And when you look at the subject of fasting through Scripture, most of the time it was a result of an impending crisis or repercussion from sin. There's people turning their hearts and their lives back to the Lord. Or it was just a posture of, God, I don't know what to do next. I need you more than anything else. So I'm going to pray. I'm going to fast. Here's what the word says in Psalm 17, 6. I call on you, my God, for you will answer me. Turn your ear to me and hear my prayer. Fasting is a lost art. It's a spiritual discipline. I need to grow in this area personally because to let you know, I don't like to fast. 
because I like to eat. If there is food, I want it. Are any of y'all do you, are you just constantly hungry? Like you've got a snack. You got I, I need a snack. You know, I just I need a protein bar. I, I just need a snack. Notorious in my family, I'm known as the snacker. So you give me a bag of chips before a game or before a movie, a bucket of popcorn. Odds are I'm not going to stop until the bag is empty. Okay. I, just, I'm at, I mean, it's just, it's, my wife even says, you're not even thinking. You're just putting a hand in your mouth. You're just eating. You're just eating. I know. I know. Because I like to eat. But oftentimes, how I've treated fasting is I've, I've treated this subject as an afterthought. That the importance of it doesn't really land where it needs to in my life. I'll give you a most recent example. So my wife makes an amazing cookie that's my favorite. It's called an Italian flag cookie. If you've ever had these, it will change your life. They're multicolored. They taste like almond. They're filled with raspberry jam, and they're covered in dark chocolate. Hallelujah. We could have church right now. I'm raising my hands. Praise the Lord. It's, an, and it's not too sweet, so you could eat as many as you want with a cup of coffee. I mean, and, and I know because I have. And, and so Lauren made some this past year, but she made some specifically for the times we were going to go visit our family for Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. So if you've ever seen my wife make these, it, it's a big sheet, and you cut them into squares, and they're all perfectly prepared. And so Lauren is cutting all of these for the family and so what's happening is she's cutting all these cookies, and then there's a pile of scraps over to the side. And so I come over. I'm like, babe, I want some Italian flag cookies. She said, no, no, no. You can't have those. She goes, you get, you get these over here. I said, these over here, the, the scraps that you're cutting off to throw in the trash? And she's like, yeah. She's like, these are the really pretty cookies, the ones that are going to go to the family. I was like, so let me get this straight. You're going to give your husband the pieces of the cookie that aren't even fit for a stranger. And that's what you're letting me, that's what you're letting me eat. Lauren's saying, yes, yes, that's correct. Yes. So, of course, I ate some cookies and enjoyed them. But the reality is, when it comes to this subject, when it comes to prayer and fasting, the Lord isn't looking for our leftovers. So when we focus on prayer and fasting at the beginning of a brand new year, it's like we're prioritizing what's most important. It's, it's a significant place where we're standing before God and saying, Lord, I'm giving you the best of the best of what I have at the start of a brand new year. Richard Foster said this, no relation. Prayer, nothing draws us closer to the heart of God. Fasting must forever center on God more than any other discipline. Fasting reveals the things that control us. Please do not forget that. And I want to show you briefly that this was a common practice for early believers and those in the early church. We're going to look at Jesus here as the main example in Matthew chapter 9, verse 14 and 15. It says this, When John's disciples came and asked him, John the Baptist, How is it that we and the Pharisees fast often, but your disciples do not fast? Jesus answered, How can the guests of the bridegroom mourn while he is with them? The time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them. Then they will fast. So this was kind of confusing to some of the other religious leaders and followers that had traveled with John the Baptist that were used to not having as much food, and they, they were used to fasting frequently. And basically, the Pharisees, they were fasting at least twice a week. And so they're coming around the disciples saying, Jesus, why, why do your followers not fast? And Jesus was drawing off a, a drawing a very important point based on this scripture he was just trying to say when I'm gone one day then those that are following me they're going to need to fast they're going to need to seek me because one day I'm not going to be with them and really what this is stating is you need to seek me first you need to place that priority in your life spiritually to fast and seek, to seek after all that Christ has. If you fast forward to Acts, which is really the account or record of the first church after Jesus was on the earth, there's also corporate fasting, individual fasting. We can see this in Acts 13. It says this, Now in the church at Antioch there were prophets and teachers while they were worshiping, in verse 2, the Lord and fasting. The Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I've called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them 
and sent them off. This is a corporate fast, a church-wide fast, what we're talking about here this weekend doing for the next seven days. 2 Corinthians 11.27, told you I have a lot of scripture this weekend. This is something specific to an individual fast where Paul said this, I've labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I've known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I've been cold and naked. And when you dive into the context of that scripture, Paul wasn't saying I'm going without food because I don't have any to eat. It was a voluntary action, saying I'm pushing away the plate. I'm I'm aware of the things that may have a grip on my life, and Lord, I'm going to fast and focus on you. Jonathan Wesley, the founder of the Methodist Church, he advocated to his church, listen to this, that you fast two days every single week to keep your flesh under control. How many of you are happy you don't attend his church? Anybody? Okay. (laughs) Two days every week. Why is fasting so powerful? How does this scriptural and, and biblical discipline work? Well, the misconception is basically that fasting, you're looking at it oftentimes through the lens of suffering. Like, I'm doing this, I'm I'm suffering for Jesus by denying myself of food. It's it's penance, so I'm going to suffer by fasting. Listen, scripturally, that's not what it's about, because let me just tell you, suffering is going to come on its own. It's called life. When we fast, when we push away the plate, it's, it's for a greater reason, because fasting is important, because you are not just you. And let me explain what I mean by that statement. You have a body. You also have a soul, which is your emotions, your will, your desire, your mental capacity. And then you also have a spirit. The spirit part of you is that which is like God, that when you accept Christ, Christ redeems, restores, recreates that spirit man, that that spirit on the inside of you, and it becomes perfectly clean and righteous because of what Jesus has done. The problem is your body and your soul need to catch up. They're not instantly redeemed. We still have our anger, our habits, our addictions, the things that try and tend to hang on to the areas of our life. And these three parts, just to let you know, are constantly at war for which one will rule and lead your life. And if we were to combine the body and the soul, and we were to call it what Scripture refers to as our flesh, if we were to combine those two, you would understand that fasting weakens the flesh, the natural part of your life. Because honestly, and I could say this for a good portion of my natural life, that the flesh tended to rule my life. My body, my soul tended to, to, to rule and guide me. Meaning you come into church, you sense the presence of God, you have this desire to grow and be more like Him. And yes, I'm going to walk out of here and life's going to be different in some of these areas. But then we go back to our normal life, where we feel defeated, where these other two parts seem to be in control. And fasting disconnects us from the things that feed the body and the soul so that the spirit man can be strengthened. And let me encourage you, if you've never fasted before, don't forget to pray during your fast. If all you're doing is not eating certain foods during the week, and you're calling it a fast, it's really just a diet. And you could just count your points, call it Weight Watchers, and you've had a great week. If I ask you next Sunday, how was your fast, and you tell me you lost three pounds, a headbutt is coming. I'm just letting you know. That's not a fast. A fast is denying our flesh so that our spirit can be made strong. It's as I deny myself, it's Jesus I gain more of you. As I put my flesh down, Christ, you are lifted up. I no longer want to crave sin. Lord, I want to crave you. I want to crave your presence. So here's a few different ways you can fast. Then we're going to dive into some different examples. You could do a complete fast. A complete fast. This is very doable, which means you could, you could go all liquid. Or I've had people that have said, I've, I've done a juice fast before. I mean, obviously, you need to consult your doctor before you start anything that would be uh, an extreme or, or total fast. And I could tell you from my own life, I've only tried this one time. I did a juice fast for two weeks. And if you ever try to do a complete fast, it's, it, at first, it just feels emotionally, it's miserable. You'll get two hours into your fast, and you're like, I'm dying. I'm physically, I'm dying. 
and I, that's, I, can't, I can't go on. I can't do it anymore. And uh, I need food, which you really don't, but it's a, it's a denial, right, of, of the things that are trying to lead your life. And I'll tell you, if you do it, don't do it the way I did, because after those two weeks of, of an all-juice fast, there was a local hibachi restaurant uh, from where we were from called Yamato's, a friend of mine. We, we went, we got all the chicken fried rice and, and hibachi grill and yum-yum sauce, and I'm not going to go into any specific detail, but just let me tell you that that decision did not end well. <laughs> That's the wrong way to do a fast. So pray, seek God. If it's a complete fast, it is doable, but I will forewarn you, yes, it is a little bit difficult. You could do a partial fast. This is where I see most people fall into this category. In the Jewish custom, a minor fast was from sunup to sundown. And for some, this is where you may say, you know what, I'm going to fast no sugar, no carbs. I'm going to push away something that tends to have a little bit of a grip on me. Uh, Other people, categorically, they talk about social media or technology. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. If you were to ask me, I would say a combination or blend of both is probably best. Because if it doesn't feel difficult, I just want to let you know, you're probably not doing the fast correctly. Because the very first time, one of the very first times anybody talked to me about fasting, um, I told a friend, we were in high school, and they're like, what are you fasting? I was like, I fasted talk radio when I was in the car. And it was like, what are you doing? Like there was, that's not hard to do. You just turn your radio off. And I realized I was just trying to escape the pain or perceived challenge of what it really meant to fast. Think about it like this. What do you love right now to consume the most? Whether that's something with food or drink or media, I don't know what it is for you, but those are the areas that when it comes to fasting, the Lord is saying, hey, I want your best, not your scraps, not your leftovers, not the things that don't really matter. Give me something that's sacrificial. Look to the things that tend to grip you the most. There's also this last category, a Daniel fast. Possibly the most popular right now uh, within certain churches where we find this in the book of Daniel in the Old Testament, Daniel chapter 10, verses 1 through 2. In the third year, Of Cyrus, king of Persia, revelation was given to Daniel, who was called Belteshazzar, and its message was true, and it concerned a great war. The understanding of the message came to him in a vision. At that time, I, Daniel, mourned for three weeks. I ate no choice food, no meat or wine, touched my lips. It's a denial of your, it's denying your body of physical pleasure. It's saying, Lord, I'm going to push this away from myself so that I can focus my attention on you. It's a declaration of dependence before the Lord. It's saying, God, I'm desperate for you as I start a brand new year. I know what last year brought, and this year it's going to be different. I'm giving you my best. And some of you, let me just encourage you, you need this week. You need this moment of prayer and fasting right now because you're praying through some things. You're seeking God you're trying to figure out what answer, what path, what next step to take, or you're up against something that just seems insurmountable and you don't want, you, you don't know what to do next. And I'm just encouraging you, starting tonight at 6 p.m., let's go for it. Let's start this fast and have some intentionality with everything that we do to let you know as a church what we're going to do to kind of help equip you We're going to start this at 6 o'clock. I mentioned it tonight, but then every morning at 6 a.m., we're going to have a five-minute or less devotional that you can watch Monday through Saturday. It's going to be focused on some specific prayer points. It's to help equip you on how you could study the Scripture with your own family, pray with your family, and then at the end of the week, of course, we're going to break the fast together. We're also going to send an email out with all the devotions written out to kind of help guide you. So, again, if you want that email to you, mark it down on the Connect card. We'll make sure it gets sent your way. But this is the posture we're going to take in Joel chapter 1, verse 14. Declare a holy fast, call a sacred assembly, summon the elders and all who live in the land to the house of the Lord your God. And cry out to the Lord. I need to encourage you that you never want to get to the place 
where society's trend simply tells you to follow your feelings when it comes to the start of a new year or big decisions that you have to make. Because let me just help you here for a minute. My name is Foster and I am your friend. Let me help you. If you follow your feelings and your feelings alone, it will not go well for you in your life. We need to follow our principles, not our feelings. We have to follow something higher than our feelings, and that's why we can't let our body and soul dictate and call the shots for our life. We want our dependence to be found in the Lord, and so that's what we're declaring this weekend. And I'm going to give you some biblical examples. There's many in the Word of God that talks about this subject of prayer and fasting. And so as a church, what are we declaring and believing God for this week? The first, if you're taking notes, we're going to be declaring revival for our nation. 1 Samuel 7, verse 3 through 6, gives us, gives us some context here. So Samuel said to all the Israelites, If you're returning to the Lord with all your hearts, then rid yourselves of the foreign gods and commit yourselves to the Lord and serve Him only. And He will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. So the Israelites, they put away their Baals and Ashtoreths and serve the Lord only. Then Samuel said, Assemble all Israel, and I, the leader of Israel, will intercede with the Lord for you. When they had assembled, they drew water, poured it out before the Lord. On that day, they fasted and they confessed, We have sinned against the Lord. I'm just going to encourage you. As a church, my prayer is, is that we're going to repent on behalf of our nation. God, please forgive us. Lord, please have mercy on us. Because what, has, what once as a nation horrified us has now become extremely common. The things in our world that we read, that we see every single day, it's like, man, this is, our hearts and our, and our eyes have turned away from the things of God. We've sinned against Him. The list could go on and on and on. And ironically, in 1863, I don't know if you recognize this. You could go look this up later. It's fascinating. Abraham Lincoln actually declared a national fast in our country. In the middle of a civil war, a nation fighting against itself, the president at that time declared a fast. I want to read part of this announcement that Lincoln made. Now, therefore, in compliance with the request... And fully concurring in the views of the Senate, I do, by this my proclamation, designate and set apart Thursday the 13th of April, 1863, as a national day of humiliation, fast, and prayer. And I do hereby request all the people to abstain from their ordinary secular pursuits and to unite at their several places of public worship and their respective homes in keeping the day holy to the Lord and devoted to the humble discharge of the religious duties proper to that solemn occasion. Listen to this. All this being done in sincerity and truth, let us then rest humbly in the hope, authorized by the divine teachings, that the united cry of the nation will be heard on high and answered with blessings. Here's where Lincoln got it right. No less than the pardon of our national sins, and restoration of our now divided and suffering country to its former happy condition of unity and peace. That was documented almost 200 years ago, but I'm going to tell you that statement is relevant today. And just like that former president had an emphasis to say, we need to seek the Lord and we need to repent on behalf of our nation, I believe that's exactly what we need to do as we move forward in 2021. Number two, we're going to be declaring freedom from persistent sin. This is something that prayer and fasting, this is, this is the spiritual result when we pray and fast. Some might use the word bondage from sin. It's a stronghold. It's that one area. It's like we all have these areas in our life that, you know, you accept Christ, you're on a path to grow and look more like Him, but there are some things at times that just hang on. They just linger. It feels like, am I ever going to get past this? Am I ever going to experience victory? Am I ever going to be on the other side of it? It just feels like it's never ending. It just keeps hanging on. And in Mark 9, 28, perfect example of what we're talking about. After Jesus had gone indoors, his disciples asked him privately, why couldn't we drive it out? 
Here's what this scripture references. There was a boy that was possessed by a demon. The disciples prayed and, and believed that the demon would come out. It did not. They were embarrassed. They were discouraged. And I apologize that we're moving through some of these stories quickly. I'm just trying to frame this in as to why we pray and fast. And in this passage of scripture, in verse 29, Christ replied, This kind can come out only by prayer, and some manuscripts say, and fasting. And what Jesus was trying to reference is that this would have been known as a, a stronghold, something that was holding that boy captive. And when you dive into the further context of that story in that scripture, Jesus actually rebuked his disciples. He said, you have little faith. And it was almost like, come on, guys. Like, really? You don't understand why this didn't happen? And the reason why Christ was frustrated was because he, he was recognizing that his disciples, his followers, they weren't using the God-given authority they had to stand against the very thing that was keeping that young man in bondage. Which means the disciples didn't have the ability in and of their own strength to free that young man but it meant they could pray and exercise their authority based on the one who does. It meant they could pray and they could believe that there would be freedom in this young man's life. And I believe this is the best possible week that we could be in church to start a new year because prayer and fasting creates a spiritual environment in which the Spirit of God can do what only He can do. When we pray and when we fast and we believe some of these things in our life are going to be broken in Jesus' name, something happens in the spiritual realm. I really can't describe it other than chains begin to fall off, freedom takes place because of the Spirit of God doing something on the inside of you. And I just want to encourage you that if you've been walking through your life with Christ and this has become a trend where the same things trip you up, over and over again, and it feels like that one thing just will not let go, I would just like to publicly encourage you and proclaim, this is going to be your year. This is going to be your year. You're going to walk free from it. You're going to walk up out of it, not because of you and your strength, but because of the power of God that's in you. And we can begin to pray and, and, and exercise the authority that we have to see God do a work in our life. You all with me? In agreement with me here? Okay, good, good. Don't fall asleep on me. We're, we're, we're not done yet. I know that there was a time in my life where I could just tell you this issue that I'm describing, that we just walked through this passage of Scripture here in Mark chapter 9, there was a time in my life where I, just, I dealt with anxiety on a level that was just unbearable. Like I would wake up in the middle of the night and, and I would have shortness of breath and it was almost like panic attacks. And I, I don't know if I was just way too high strung, just anxious all the time. And just, I mean, I remember as a, as a young kid, I, I would bite my fingernails like down to the quick. It was like bad, like just because I was just, I was always so just unsettled in my emotional state. I just could not feel like I could rest. You know, something happened when, I started following Christ. And I'm going to tell you, I didn't overcome it. It wasn't self-help or I'm just going to just get through it. No, the, the Spirit of God does something on the inside of you. He breaks things in our life. Addictions, things that tend to hang on and hold us back. And I believe this week is going to be a time where God's going to do something like that for you, whatever it is that you're walking through. Number three, we're almost finished here. In fact, I'm going to ask the team to come back up if they would. We're going to be declaring blessing over trouble. There's a passage in Ezra chapter 8, verses 21 through 23. I'm going to read this. Ezra said this, I proclaimed a fast so that we might humble ourselves before our God and ask him for a safe journey for us and our children with all of our possessions. I was ashamed to ask the king for soldiers and horsemen to protect us from enemies on the road because... We had told the king, the gracious hand of our God is on everyone who looks to him. But his great anger is against all who forsake him. So we fasted and petitioned our God about this, and he answered our prayer. I don't have time to go into the whole story, but Ezra was tasked with a monumental mission. 
He was to bring 7,500 pounds of gold and almost 2 million pounds of silver from the city that he was in to where he was in Jerusalem. And he was praying to God for a safe journey. Protect my family because there are thieves and bandits that were going to be around him along the way in this journey. And I believe in, in 2021, we need to pray for blessing and protection over trouble for our family and our household. Because to be quite honest with you, I don't want to say this to discourage you, but I, I just I have to as your pastor. Trouble's coming. It's coming whether you see it, whether you believe it or not. It's on its way. Thank you for coming to Keystone Church where I'm here to encourage you on Sunday. But you know that we have somebody that's greater than whatever it is that's headed your way. You know that you can pray through and pray against the trouble that perhaps the enemy has designed for your life. I believe that we can have blessing over this like Ezra prayed if we will trust and seek God. It doesn't mean we're going to avoid every painful moment, but it means we have the opportunity to fast and pray and seek our gracious God. We're raising two kids right now, a teenager in our home. I am blown away right now with what this younger generation is having to deal with. I can't even imagine it. I mean, back when my wife and I graduated high school a long time ago, Man, I remember hearing adults talk about our generation. I'm like, that was nothing compared to what's going on today. We need to pray for our kids. We need to pray protection over our family. Every power in hell is trying to grip this next generation. I'm just letting you know. So I believe at the start of a new year, we just have to have a passion that if, if you are responsible for children in your home, I'm just going to encourage you, fathers in this room, man, we need to take it up a notch in 2021. I mean, I've talked to my wife about some things, trying to do more intentional, just have intentional moments and conversations. What you did last year is not going to cut it for 2021. We need to seek God for our family. If you've got something in your life we could be praying for, mark it down. That's why we have this connect card. That's the whole reason I talk about it. It's not because I want you to fill out a piece of paper. It's because we've got people here that want to pray for you. At the end of service, we're going to have people down front. They're going to pray over you if you need something, an area of your life to be prayed for. Just want to know. And this last point, as a church, we're going to be declaring healing from your past and wisdom for your future. I mentioned some of you, you might be faced with some big decisions in 2021. Should I take this job, move to that city, marry that person, date this individual? I don't really know. What's my gut tell me? No, no, no. Put that aside. We're not following our body or our soul. We're following our spirit. So what we're going to do over the next seven days, we're going to pray, we're going to fast, we're going to seek God so that our spirit can grow stronger and we can find the direction in which the Lord has for our lives. I'm just letting you know that this first year, next week as we celebrate as a church, this first year as a church planner has been bananas. (laughs) If somebody would have told me that's how your first year is going to go when you go to plant a church, I'm pretty sure that we still would have come to plant the church, but I would have been like, well, I mean, maybe we'll we'll come back to it in a few years. You know, just let let this kind of, you know, work itself out. But can I tell you something that it's taught me personally over the last year? I am so unbelievably desperate for God and his direction. I don't have the answers. In fact, I'm going to ask you as a church, would you please pray for me when you think about it? I'm being very serious. I mean, I need I need you to pray. Because there are there have been so many moments this past year I've grabbed my wife's hand and said, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do next. You know what it's forced me to do? I go and pray. Because that's where I need to go anyways, because that's my first response, not my last resort. But I'm praying, I'm moving through things so slowly. I'm like, God, I just want to do what you want. This is not man-made wisdom. This is, Lord, we need your will. We need your way. We need your direction. I need you to show me how to lead your church. You might think, well, Foster, you're the pastor. You planted this church. Yeah, but this really isn't my church. It's his church. You're not our people. You're God's people. We're in this together, but he's the one that's in charge. He's the one that's leading the way. I can feel the sobering sobering weight of responsibility. 
I'm just telling you, we need the spirit of wisdom. Nothing man-made. I'm going to read this last example in Acts chapter 9. Something that happened right after Saul, who was later known as Paul, encountered Christ face to face. It was like he had this encounter with the Lord on the road to Damascus. and His life was forever changed. In the previous chapters in Acts where it talks about the early church, Saul is mentioned many times. He was one of the biggest persecutors and enemies of the church, killing Christians. He was there when the first martyr, when Stephen was stoned, he was overseeing it. He was there watching it all take place. Then radically, Jesus transforms his life when he's on a path that he had designed. Christ intervenes and said, no, you're not going that way. You're going to go this way. And here's where we pick it up in Acts chapter 9, verse 9. It says, for three days he was blind. He did not eat or drink anything. In that passage right there, he didn't eat or drink anything. It talks about theologians believe he was so overwhelmed with what God did in his life. It was like, I'm not going to eat. I'm, I'm, I'm fasting. It's like, Christ is so real to me now. The least I can do is push away the plate. Then in Acts 9, 17, it says, Then Ananias went to the house and entered it, because he was led to go pray for this man named Saul. Placing his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes. He could see again. He got up and was baptized. After taking some food, he regained his strength. Scripturally, the scales that fell off his eyes, many debates on what that means, but it was like whatever was blinding him physically, the Lord healed him instantaneously after this brother in Christ prayed for him. But more than a physical healing, you have to understand that, that Saul, who was later known as Paul, was healed spiritually as well. And then not only was it that he had a physical healing, but he's like, now I have direction. My course has been totally corrected. So the direction I was headed, now I'm going to head towards the path that Christ has for me. And I don't know if you could imagine this, but the person that was once the greatest enemy at the church now has become one of the greatest heroes of the church. The Lord healed his past. Some of us, we've gone through times in our life where because of the way we've lived or because of those things that have held us back, we think to ourselves, God couldn't possibly use my life for anything good because of all the things that I've done. And I'm letting you know, here's a man whose life was radically transformed and was able to accomplish great things for the Lord if you will give God permission to use your life, if you'll surrender to him. read an amazing statistic this past week. Fits perfectly into this as we get ready to close. Over 51% of people that declare themselves as Christians, they actually don't believe in a devil. They don't believe they have a spiritual enemy. They don't believe he exists. And can I tell you this, church? Just because you don't believe in him doesn't mean he ain't coming for you. And I don't want to say that to scare you. I'm just telling you, there is an enemy who has a plan to steal, kill, and destroy whatever it is that God has for your life. But the word says, as we read earlier in Ephesians chapter 6, that we don't war against flesh and blood. Our struggle isn't against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, authorities, and powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces in the heavenly realm. You have access to a power that's far greater than any design the enemy has placed before your life. So starting 2021, why do we pray? Why do we fast? So that we can position ourselves for that power to make a spiritual difference in our life. That's why we fast. That's why we seek the Lord. Thanks for joining us this weekend. So glad that you had an opportunity to join us for church online. We're praying for you, believing God's best for you, Keystone Church. If you need anything at all, please do not hesitate to reach out. We have a team of people that would love to pray with you, believe God with you. Whatever it is that you need, we want to continue to make Keystone Church for you and your family feel more like home. 
We love you. God bless. See you next weekend.